Okay, uh, you guys should be able to see the presentation. Yeah, if I'm... Yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks everyone for, for turning up uh, today. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm not an expert in XCS or, or anything. This is, this is meant to be a very entry level uh, presentation tonight. It's just to give you guys a bit of a flavor of what, what is XCSOR and what kind of things you can do and how you go about um, getting one. So um, just for Andrew, this was after I landed from the uh, 7,000 foot aerotow flight. Um, so what we'll cover tonight, uh, i just move that. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what other, uh, what other navigation software, uh, bits of software is available, uh, but it's going to be mainly around um, XCSAW. Um, what kind of kits you can uh, use to run the, the navigation software in, um, how to install XCSAW. I'm not going to go into a huge detail on, on how to do it. Uh, there's loads of online help and, and the manual covers it pretty well, but sort of a, a one page summary on that. Uh, things to look out for when, when you use navigation software. And then will be the, the demo where I'll sort of showcase um, XCS or a little bit on, on the code and how you go about um, setting up the, the, the different files and so on. Okay, so what navigation software is available? Um, as you can see there from the from the right hand side, there's a whole bunch um, of stuff. Um, Andrew, you did ask me to remind you to see if it's recording, so just make sure. Roger, we're good. it's recording. We're on. Okay. Um, so some of the stuff that is available, obviously XCSOR, which I, I will talk in a little bit. Um, you've got CU as well, which is a, a very good bit of software, uh, especially for post flight analysis. Um, it is paid. Um, I can't remember how much the monthly membership it is. Um, 50 pounds a month. Yeah, so there you go. But it, it's no. very, very good. Um, and it will work with things like the UDI and, and stuff. Um, but again, if you're looking for a, a free solution, that's probably not the way to go. Co correction, 50 pounds a year. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's how okay. expensive. Um, you then have um, LK8000, which was originally developed by one of the guys that was on the XC's SOAR team. Uh, they then sort of fall out of it, and um, LK8000 was developed as a, as, a, as a separate thing. I've played a little bit with LK8000. Um, on the first pass, is very, very similar from XC's SOAR, as you'd expect. I just find it a little bit more fiddly to, to fine-tune, so I, I don't particularly enjoy it very much. Um, and the same goes for Top Hat. So Top Hat, again, is a free software. You can get it online. Uh, I just, uh, the, the code behind and the mechanics work in a very similar way to XC's So um, It's just, I, I don't like the interface. I think the information that it shows is, is not in a very intuitive way. And, you, and you'll see in a second um, with, with XC's So um, You then have, we started to see quite a lot of new apps coming about uh, developed by glider pilots. So things like iGlide, and I know John McLaughlin uh, sent out the link a few weeks ago about a, another um, um, Apple-based um, uh, app that you can install. Um, they, are, they tend to be developed by glider pilots. Um, I haven't dealt with iGlide um, too much, but, but it's there in case you want to, uh, to research. Um, and I will make a nod to Sky Demon. Um, I think it's a very it's a big shame that Sky Demon doesn't actually have the features that we need as glider pilots. Um, having uh, flown with, with other people that use Sky Demon and having played around with Sky Demon a little bit, it is generally one of the neatest bit of kids that I've ever seen. Uh, but for gliding, is, it doesn't really give you a lot of information unless you use it purely as a navigation tool. So you'll see with XCSOR, you can get the navigation side of it, but also the, the, the gliding flight performance side of it, if you like. If you just after a navigation tool, uh, SkyDemon is, is pretty good. You can't do the BGA turn points, but I believe you can do, you can create your own turn points um, in, um, in SkyDemon. Um, you, you can download them actually, Tiago. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you have to. It's a bit fiddly, but you can get a file and get them on. Yeah, I, I, I was under the impression that it's there is a work around it. Uh, the, the bit that you can't work around is is the lack of gliding information. Um, I don't think Sky Demon will ever provide that. There isn't that much of a gliding population to start with, and then people that would be uh, willing to pay for the service, I think, will never see Sky Demon provide that service. 
um, but go on. So why do I use XSOR? Um, it's free, so it doesn't really cost anything. Um, it's a very good tool. Um, you can, with post-flight analysis, you probably need something like TaskNav, which is free as well, uh, or CU if you want to, to pay for, for the service. But the app itself is, is free. And to be honest, it, you get quite a lot of bang for your no bucks, essentially. Um, it's relatively intuitive to use. So a lot of the stuff that I know is by just picking up the code and, and playing with it and seeing what works, what doesn't work. Um, and it's also relatively straightforward to use it with things like Condor, for example. Um, one of the things that I like, uh, so it uses the, the files that it uses, for example, the airspace files uh, or the turn point files. They're very easy to understand how to program it. So as Chris alluded in his, in his talk, I've put together the, um, the Lakes Challenge uh, file behind. Um, and it, was, it took me about two hours. And the bit that took longer was actually working out the coordinates. It's very easy to program files to go into, into XCSOR. So you can create your own uh, turn points or your own airspace files. Um, there is generally nothing that you can that you want to do an XE so that you can't find help online. Uh, the, um, the type of help varies depending on very straightforward advice to very complicated things that you can't sort of work out by yourself. Uh, but generally there are loads of help um, on, online on how to use XE so and how to program it. And it's very easy to configure to your preferences. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit how you can do that. But it, again, it's very intuitive to sort of come up with a setup that works for you. One thing that is worth saying about XCSOR, I don't know about the other, um, the other bits of software, but I believe it's going to be the same thing. You cannot use files from XCSOR to claim badges. Um, so you will need something like the portable loggers that myself and Andrew and Phil use, or you need an ITC capable flan uh, in the glider. I believe most of the club ones, definitely the single seaters um, are um, ITC capable. Um, so just bear that in mind that if you do, for example, your 50K and then you say, oh, I'll record it on XCSOR, uh, that is not an acceptable file uh, to submit to Basel and you'll get your flight invalidated. So, and it's always good practice to have a backup. Okay, um, so XCSOR is just a bit of software. You need some bit of hardware to run um, XCSOR out of. So when you go and get your kit, the things to consider, um, for me, the, the main one is sunlight. Um, so you'll, you're going to spend a lot of time in the, in the sunshine. If you've got screens, for example, the tablet screens and the phone screens are not designed to be exposed to sunlight for very long periods of time. So you will get quite a lot of contrast. And I'll, I'll show you a picture in a second. So make sure that you've got a device that you can read in any sort of light condition. Uh, battery life. Uh, you kind of want something that lasts, you know, a few hours. Um, the, one of the bits of kit that I've got, and I'll show you in a second, the battery life is completely atrocious. Um, it, the kit itself is very good. It's just battery life is, is a bit of an issue. Now, you can work around it by carrying a portable battery, but think about space being at a premium. Think about flying Lima Tango, for example, and you're putting an extra bit of kit, an extra battery, yourself, uh, uh, the charts and everything. So try to go for something that gives you, you know, a few hours battery life. Um, we, I just talked a little bit about cockpit clutter. So you will have to carry your phone and then a, a different device. You then have to mount that different device somewhere in, in the cockpit. So think about in terms of size and mountings and, and all of that stuff. You, you kind of need to keep, especially the canopy ar uh, area so you can maintain an effective lookout. Think when you go and buy this kit, make sure that you pick something that, you know, it's not going to take valuable space from, from the glider cockpit. Um, another key one, you <coughs> don't want to spend a huge amount of time sort of squinting and bending down and, oh, what does that box say? It needs to be something that at a glance, you get the information you want out of it when you want out of it. And more importantly, it needs to be something that you sort of intuitively know what that information is. <coughs> If you've got something very, very small, for example, you will struggle to read. And there's, today there was a very good article on Flyer on Facebook about uh, an airspace incursion 
with someone that had a portable navigation kit installed on the passenger side and he was struggling to read the altitude out of it. So it, it just goes to show that these things can, can happen. Um, audible warnings. Um, it's a big drawback with the Kobos. Most of them will not give you a warning if you are about to enter airspace. So that means you have to spend a bit more time looking at the Kobo and so on. You, you want something that will give you an audible warning saying you're coming into airspace. So you in, intuitively know that you're about to infringe something. So think about the reason why we use audio varios. You kind of want the same principle with your navigation bit of kit. Um, and portability. So you want some, especially if you don't own your own glider, you're going to be flying Hun, you're going to be flying Lima Tango. You want something that you can easily carry from glider to glider, and, and it's relatively straightforward to mount on those different gliders. So with that in mind, what, you know, there is a, a, a wide range of displays, but they tend to fall in sort of three main categories. Uh, the first one is you can use your own uh, mobile phone or a, a, our own tablet. Um, and again, if, especially if you use your mobile phone, um, you're only going to get one bit of, uh, one bit of electronic kit uh, that doubles up as a mobile phone as well. Um, you can see in the picture there, the issue that I said about the sunlight. You can see there's quite a lot of shading, quite a lot of reflections on, on that screen. Direct sunlight might be a bit of an issue. Um, the, the other thing as well to bear in mind, the although the GPS accuracy on phones and tablets these days tend to be pretty good, make sure that you sort of do a bit of a test to say how accurate your GPS is. If you don't fly that close to airspace um, or the area where you're flying the airspace is not that complex, is not that much of an issue, uh, but do make sure that you understand the GPS limitations as well. And one thing I forgot to list there, um, if you use your own phone, think about landouts as well. So you're going to be using uh, your phone as a navigation tool. Um, if you land out, you need to call back for, for help. So make sure that you, um, you take that into consideration as well. Um, so we talked about dedicated um, Android or Apple tablets, which is essentially a bigger version of, of your phone. Uh, Kobo. So a lot of people tend to use a Kobo, and that was my first navigation kit. So um, I'm going to assume, because I can't see my, my own screen, I'm going to assume that you all can see this. So this is sort of the typical installation with a Kobo. Um, and you've got your um, XC saw there. And then you normally have one of these um, Blue Fly uh, GPS and audio varios. Essentially, you will need to install a, a bespoke GPS. Now, these things are pretty good in sunlight. So the contrast that you see there and you see on the screen is pretty much what you get uh, with low light conditions, direct sunlight, and et cetera. Battery life on these things is tremendous. I've done my five hour flights on it and then did the week after another two hour flight without having to, to charge a Kobo. So that's battery life is pretty good. Um, on, um, on the negative sides, um, so what you've got here on the screen and Andy, just give me a shot if you can see the Kobo. So the one yes, that I'm we're, sharing. We're still now. looking at the presentation at the moment. Okay. So I'll just stop the screen sharing for the moment. So this is the, um, my current Kobo, and that's the airspace area uh, around my house. And you can, so I live relatively close to East Midlands, and you can see that it's, when you sort of look at the screen, you can't really tell what is a controlled area control zone quite quickly. You can see there's different boundaries to the airspace, but you can see that it's relatively difficult to interpret what what is what. If you then compare it to a colored version of, Oh God, this, this is a disaster. Uh, okay, we'll come back to that later on with a different um, highlight. But you can, see, if you go for a colored version, which unfortunately the contrast here is not very good on the camera, it becomes a lot easier to see the airspace. So with the Kobo, a big limitation is you'll see loads of little lines, loads of blocks on the airspace. And if you, especially if it's airspace that you are new to, um, it's, you become a bit unsure about where, where you are. So bear that in mind. Um, and again, you don't, you don't have any audio warnings. I've tried desperately to get help on this. And I think it was with version four or version five of uh, XESaw. They've actually changed um, the software interface with the Kobo. And you can no longer get audio warnings with things like the Bluefly, which is the, uh, the little box you see there on the side. 
So that box doubles up as a, as a vario. So as you go up, it beeps like an audio vario. In theory, the Kobo talks with with the with the blue fly, but not for airspace warnings, which is a big shame. The other just thing we can we've got a question, Tiago, from yeah. uh, from Piotra, just asking about ADSB like Sky Echo compatibility. So I think XC Sor is not compatible yet. Um, I need to do a bit more research on that. It's definitely compatible with Flan. Um, but I think you need to connect it on your glider. You would need to collect, uh, connect it via Bluetooth between the Flan and the Kobo, or, or sorry, between the Flan and XE. So I would, at a guess, imagine that ADSB, so things like Sky Echo, would be a similar arrangement. But I haven't researched that in in detail. I can I can definitely look into that. But yes, you would you would imagine that. <laughs> If you can do that, that one of the advantages or uh, that Sky Demon has, for example, you can then try to read it across as well. Well, also it, it lets you see other traffic. That's the that's the main, main it, idea. On exactly. Exactly. And with, with Sky Demon, you use the actual ADSB device as your GPS. Yes. Yeah. So go on. I, I think Sky Demon is a very very good tool. Uh, it's just. As a navigation tool and as a as a traffic avoidance tool, um, it's it's very very good. And I know that X you saw you can talk with the farm. I haven't seen anything on things like Sky Echo, but I'm sure that there will be a work around that. Okay, so the last bit is uh, you can get a dedicated hardware. So the little box I was trying to show is what you see there on the right hand side. So that's called a, an Acula GPS. Um, that was designed by. Um, glider pilots. Uh, by the way, I don't have any affiliation with the company. I just think it's a it's quite a neat uh, bit of kit. Um, so it's an Android-based system. So you're effectively running a tablet, uh, but the interface is a bit better to use. So you can split between the Android side of the uh, of the Acula and the um, Axis Saw side. Um, and the, it has a color screen that has been designed for sunlight exposure. And you've got the audio warnings as well. So every time you go into airspace, it pings. And I've, I've been flying Condor a little bit, and it, it works like a treat. Um, price point, these two guys are quite comparable. Um, so I got my Acula. So this is a French company that sells it. Um, it's about 200 quid with landed costs in the UK. With the Kobo, if you provide your own, for someone else to build it with the Kobo, the Blue Fly, and the time to put it together, it will be about the same uh, the same price. The issue with the Acula, the battery life is terrible. You can get two hours out of it at best, and you kind of need to turn off things like uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and all of that. So realistically, you get about an hour and a half out of it if you if you're careful. Uh, but it is, having flown with it a bit in Condor, it's quite a neat uh, bit of kit. So, okay. Question, Thiago. Are you, yeah. Is it a normal USB power? So would you be able to use a, ba a battery bank? With, uh, with yeah, it's uh, just like any normal tablet. Uh, so you can see there on the sides, you've got uh, a normal USB um, uh, charge um, to, to it. So yeah, you can plug. And in fact, the, the guys in Acula say, you know, just use a, an external power bank to uh, to power it. But it's it's a very so in terms of uh, size comparison, the 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 scale that you see there is more or less the 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 scale that they are. So the the Acula is about the same size as the uh, the Kobo screen, which reduces clutter a, a little bit. Um, but it's it's quite a neat uh, a neat little bit of kit to be honest. Okay. So you've selected your, uh, your software, and for the sake of argument, let's say it's XE SOAR, you've selected your bit of kit. Um, so how do you go about doing it? Um, if you use an Android device, so your own phone, tablet, or something like the Acula, you can download it directly from Google Play, and that's it. Um, if you then use something like the Kobo, um, you need to download the latest version from the XE SOAR website. Um, and then you need to put the latest version on a particular folder. Um, but again, you can, um, I've, I've got some links later on that show you how you can go about doing it. It's not particularly difficult uh, on the Kobo. It's just a bit more fiddly because you have to drop the software version. 
um, into a particular folder. If you um, if you have someone make a cover for you, uh, which is how I got mine in the first place, it comes with XESO pre-installed, but the version that the, the person may install may not be the latest one. So it's still your responsibility as a pilot to make sure that you've got the latest software version installed. Okay, so you've got your Kobo, everything's installed. Uh, you decide to go and fly, uh, great, um, except you make mistakes. Now, the stuff on this list is stuff that I've done. Uh, it's not me preaching, it's me saying, oh, I've done these things, so chances are at some point you'll do one or more of them. Um, so remember that you are the pilot in command uh, and not XC saw. Um, so you are responsible for how the flight goes. Just because XC saw tells you that you can do something, um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you, you can. Uh, for example, um, glider polars, for example, they are idealized glider polars, not the glider polar for the glider that you're flying on the day. Um, and your primary responsibility is to fly the aircraft. So if you get a bit confused with all the information that XSOR is giving you, you still have to make sure that you are flying the aircraft safely. Um, bad information management. Uh, XSOR, if you're not careful, it can give you a lot of information. And if you are thermally close to an airspace and the thing is beeping and giving you alarms and, you know, it can be a big, big distraction. It can be a time away from your lookout. The worst thing that you can do is to get uh, Exesor going, get it all set up with all the info boxes around and then figuring out in the air what exactly is that box telling you. Really spend some time, especially now that we're not doing anything particularly useful in the flying front, really spend some time understanding what each of those boxes gives you at what point, what are the limitations and so on. Um, safety margins for glide calculations. So when you do, when you're flying along um, in a task, at some point you will say within uh, final glide and you think, oh great, I'll just point the nose and here we go. And then you land in the field two miles off um, the, the airfield. Um, again, if you pick a particular airfield, is that airfield actually open? Have you read the note times? If, you, um, if you're not careful um, and not set up the safety, uh, the safety factors correctly, um, so if your safety factor is zero feet, you will make it back to the airfield at zero feet. You still need to fly a circuit and land the aircraft. Um, so make sure that when you start a flight or you get the information about uh, final glides and how far can you stretch your glide, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure that you understand the limitations of the information that it's giving you. And in particular, um, and you can configure XC sort for different aircraft. If you go from aircraft to aircraft, make sure that you select the right aircraft for the flight that you're doing. This has happened, remember. When you sort of think that you're flying a Janus, for example, whilst flying a K-13. They are not the same. Um, the other thing is, all of these are electronic devices, and they fail. And again, during my five-hour flight, although XESO was still working in the background, the screen completely froze. Um, batteries ran out. So you still need to be able to pick up a chart and figure out where you are and how you're going to get safely to where you need to be. So make sure that you don't rely on these things to do cross-country flying. Um, it's your responsibility to update, especially the airspace files. Um, if you fly with a, an airspace file from 2002, chances are it's out of date. Um, so make sure that at the start of every season, you update the latest airspace and turnpoint files, and you regularly check for updates. Um, airspace changes quite a lot, or, or can change quite quite a lot in, in certain areas. So make sure that you've got the latest files available and keep a regular eye on it. Um, the, the glider will point up in a certain direction. Is that track up or north up? Um, well, it's down to you, it's your preference. I fly with track up. I, I find it a bit easier to navigate. Um, but when the glider is pointing a particular way, make sure that you understand which way that, that is. Is it north or is it along your track? You can get lost quite easily if you don't really know 
Or if someone lends you a code and say, oh, you can just take mine for the flight, make sure that you ask basic questions like, is this north up or track up? Do not figure that one out whilst you're flying. Um, There's a, a point by Phil Donovan uh, jumping in there, Tiago. Yeah. Uh, obviously, um, he's pointed out airspace updates every 28 days. And yeah, so I tend, I, I tend to look for mine every two weeks um, during, during the summer. Um, obviously, during the winter, it's just if I know that I'm going to fly. But yes, do keep a, a good lookout for airspace updates. Um, if you use Condor um, with a Kobo, um, and I highly recommend you do, um, the, you effectively disable the GPS from the XC you saw, and you, you get fed information from Condor. Now, the key words here are, you disable the GPS. Don't wait until you're 3,000 uh, foot over the airfield to figure out, I forgot to turn on the GPS. So when you do your event, your um, checks, your pre-launch checks, as part of the instruments, if you're flying with an XC soar, is it working? Is it configured correctly? This is effect, becomes effectively an aircraft instrument that you're flying with. So make sure that it's operating correctly. Okay, so useful links. Uh, I'm not going to go through them in, in detail. You can always come back uh, on the YouTube recording, but effectively you've got uh, how you can go about getting some of this uh, bit of kit. I've included there um, links on how to connect XCSOAR to Condor as well. So it, once you get XCSOAR and you've got your boxes and you kind of want to see, does this work for me? Does this format work? Is it providing all the information I want? And you've got Condor. Even if you don't use Condor to fly, just to see how it interacts, I highly recommend you do that. And if you do have a Bluetooth capable laptop, I would recommend using the Bluetooth version. It's just a lot easier to set up. Uh, but you've got there as well how you can go about getting uh, the airspace files, the BGA turn points, and then things like um, UK airfields for radio frequencies and so on. Um, another one that I recommend is this get high and stay high. Uh, so the guy has written quite a few articles on SNG about using Kobo and XESOR. He can supply you with a Kobo, uh, but he also has loads of really easy to follow hints and um, help uh, guides and so on. Um, so highly recommend that website. Okay, so it's time for the demo. Uh, before we go to that one, is there any sort of pressing question? If not, I'll uh, I'll set up my uh, my display my display arena. You're dropping off there, Graham. He's he's so excited with my explanations that he actually falls asleep. So relaxed there. I'm, I'm very chilled. I've just been stroking the dog, and chilling out, listening to it, thinking, oh, my word, it's so complicated for me. <laughs> it's, it's really not. It's, it's one of those no, things. No, no, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> the, the more, the more you, you play with it, um, like other things in life, the more you play with it, the, uh, the better you get at it. Right. So this should... Or you wear it out. Well, <laughs> there is that as well. Right, okay, so that's working. Now, I cannot guarantee that this is going to work very well. Uh, it worked yesterday, uh, and it worked before we started. Uh, right, so. Can I just exit in again? Okay, so it should go up there. Okay, can everyone see that window with the, with the Kobo? Perfect. Yeah, very Perfect. good. Okay, cool. So I thought about the best way to do this, and the original plan was to record a whole bunch of little videos with help. Uh, doesn't really work, and this way we can go along, and you guys can ask um, for help or any questions you've got as we go along. So you've got your your Kobo. When you start XESOR, you've got these these two options. So you're you're flying and you're sim. Uh, for the time being, I'm going to switch off the um, 
the GPS, uh, mainly because it sort of gets confused a bit and it muddles the waters. But we've got these two options. Now, the sim is essentially if you want to replay one of your flights or if you um, kind of want to play with Xisor a bit or you want to change the info boxes and you want to see how it works. I personally don't really like the simulation mode that much. Um, I think if you've got access to Condor, that's probably an easier way to do because you can get that realism of flying the aircraft whilst sort of looking at um, at Exusor and see that, that interface. So if you want to use it, you're going to fly and it loads up uh, Kobo. And depending on the setup you've got, uh, you will see um, a map. Uh, so that's the sort of main area there. Uh, normally, I fly with an airspace cross section uh, that appears here. And then you've got some information boxes around the, uh, the Kobo where you get all the information that you need, um, that you've pre-selected that you want to see during a flight. And there's a whole bunch of boxes and we'll go into, into details there. So in my particular case, I've got um, uh, battery life, the altitude required for the next turn point, uh, the average uh, uh, climb rate that I'm getting for the day, velocity over the ground, height above the ground, next turn point, which normally gives you the turn point name and the distance um, or radio frequencies or whatever, uh, turn point distance. And then if you, the ATC radio basically tells you how far you are from your um, air traffic control unit um, and the direction. So if you're talking with them, it's easy to give uh, position reports and distances and so on. If I show you a different window, so again, you can have something configured that just shows you the map and the airspace cross section. Uh, or you can, as you flick to the side, you can have an option that just shows you uh, the map and, and that's it. And you, and this is a sort of very usual um, setup where you can see that we've got, um, so this is actually configured for a Sutton Bank, but you can see uh, around the, the different uh, landable fields, so um, Sutton Bank, Bagby, um, and then you've got your, uh, your turn points, uh, your BGA turn points as well. And again, you can configure um, if you want the full name, just three letters, etc. It shows a glider on it at 7,000 feet, Thiago. Uh, no, so in this case, I'm so high, the glider doesn't actually appear anymore. <laughs> see, if I'm, if I'm going to take the piss, I might as well own it. Um, so you can see here that you can, you can have a display that just shows your, your map and your information. You don't necessarily need um, your airspace uh, cross-section. Uh, the airspace cross section is very similar to what you see on Sky Demon, so it will show you a box, your flight path, and whether or not you're going to clear that um, uh, that airspace. Um, so, if you tap on any particular location, uh, it tends to tell you what's on that bit of airspace. So, in this particular uh, instance, it will say Southern Bank Control Point North. Uh, you can do this um, on any bit of airspace, and it will give you. Uh, what are the uh, limits there? So for example, let's suppose that I want to go to Cyprus. So at the moment it's reckon it's set up to say Southern Bank is my home airfield. Let's say that you want to set up Cyprus, for example. Normally you've got this M symbol here, which as the, num the name would indicate you access the menu. And you've got a whole bunch of options that we'll, we'll go into uh, into a second. So navigation, um, and you go to your waypoint list, you, you click name, and then you start typing. Normally the three letters, the first three letters uh, will suffice. Um, and then, so it will give you the information on, on the turn point. And again, this is what comes in from your input files. So this is the description from the BGA of what the turn point is, radio frequencies, location and, and elevation. If you then click on the arrow site, uh, you can set as new home. And I believe once I come out, it will set, you will set um, Cypher back as your home airfield and just restart it. So it will account for that. And there you go. So now you are in Cypher. And as I click there um, on, so if you click on the airspace around it, it will say you've got a class A airspace starting at five and a half thousand feet up to flight level uh, 195. You can't really read that well, but that's, trust me on this. 
Um, you can also click on uh, a particular turn point. So if you click uh, there in stone, it will tell you around that area, you've got a, a BGA turn point, but you also have the same um, airspace as well. And you can, you can do this with any bit of, of airspace uh, that you want. Uh, zoom in and out, um, relatively straightforward. So you scroll down and it zooms out and you scroll in and it zooms in. Again, the Kobo screen is, not, is a bit fiddly. Um, and again, you can set this up to give you an automate, um, auto zoom as, you, as you're flying along. So if you're on cruise mode, you will naturally zoom out. If you're uh, thermaling, it will zoom into the area where, where you're thermaling. So uh, how do you configure all of this? So if you go to the configuration menu, it will give you a whole bunch of, um, of options that, that you can configure. I'm not gonna go necessarily for all of them, just sort of the, uh, the main ones that you would probably interact the, the, the sort of first few times. And again, in the links that I've showed um, earlier, there's loads of useful advice. But the normal bit or the, the first bit to start is in system and then it'll take you to where you effectively can configure most of the stuff. So site files is where you're gonna select your, um, your airspace files. By the way, when you get it, um, make sure that the expert box is ticked in because it gives you a bit more options. So for example, on the airspaces allows you to have two airspace files. And I normally fly with uh, the uh, normal airspace. So that will give me the class A, class Ds and so on. But under more airspaces, you can load up, for example, no times for the day. So you can create from, um, uh, from the normal no time websites, you can create a text file that is then read to, uh, to the Kobo and you load it up in the same way that you load up any airspace file. And again, um, consult the, uh, the user guide for, for that one. But again, you can load up things like the, the waypoints. So on a particular day, you might say, I want to use the BGA turn points. And then for the more waypoints, you can use the uh, lakes challenge, for example. Or you, if you're going cross country, you can use the um, airfield file there that will give you the different frequencies for the um, airfields, the, the actual airfields um, as you fly along. If you move to the right, um, you can move through the different pages in the settings, or you can just go back to, uh, to the configuration menu and, and do it by yourself. Um, so again, orientation, this is sort of what we talked about, track up or, or north up. Um, I tend to have track up during cruising and then north up during circling. But again, you can configure all of this. Um, other useful things, the glide computer. So we talked about the, the safety factor. So this is where you say, um, how do I want XCSOAR to calculate my final glides? So I tend to say, I want to arrive at my home airfield with a thousand feet um, over the ground. You can set it up to 800, for example. Um, and I want to clear any terrain obstructions by a thousand foot um, at least. And then you can set your, your McCready. So I can say, if I want to calculate the final glide, I want to kind of go on survival mode. So a McCready setting of zero, for example. Um, so on the look, uh, on the look page, again, you can do things like the screen layout. So you can say, for example, I how many boxes do I want? Do I want eight boxes split between the top screen and the bottom screen, like I had earlier, or do I just want um, a, a nine boxes all on the left or the right and a Vario? Um, I think one of the pictures on Mike Fox's uh, book shows a Vario on the side, so you can include that as well. Uh, you can put 12 info boxes, etc. The The word of warning there is the more boxes you put in, the smaller the information is going to get, the more difficult it's going to get to read. Uh, so you can do that as well. And then on setup, you will get your things like you can set up your, your units as well. So you can say, how do you want um, uh, your distances to be displayed, your temperatures, speeds, etc. Okay, so that's how you sort of basically go about configuring it. Um, we can come back to this uh, in a bit more detail. So you've now configured the whole thing uh, to, to your like, um, and you say, okay, um, 
I want to go fly. Well, remember what I said before about configuring, making sure that your aircraft is correct. So, uh, just I just did that uh, a bit too quickly. So on the main on the main screen, you go into menu. This is really hard to do, by the way. So you go into menu, you go into config, and then plane. Now you can see there that I've got a whole bunch of planes um, already set up, um, but you can create your new aircraft. So you can say, I want to create a new aircraft. You can give whatever registration you want, um, your competition ID, and then you can select the polar. You can either design your own polar, uh, so you can design the parameters um, that you know from your aircraft logbook, or, or sorry, from the aircraft manual or your own experiments. Uh, or you can select the, the aircraft type. So, uh, sorry. So if you go to list, you can see you've got a whole bunch of, of aircraft that you can select there. So if you've got a nice ASW-19, for example, uh, you can see the, the parameters there on the polar will, will change. You can also select your handicap. You can select the water ballast that you've got. Um, you can select your uh, your dump times as well for for water. So all of that is is configurable. Again, the the words of advice there is when you do fiddle with uh, your glider polar and the parameters and so on, make sure that you understand what you're doing because that data is what Xsor uses to calculate things like final glides, uh, cruise speeds, and all of that. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions and, and observations, Thiago, from the chat. Yeah. Uh, Peter is asking, is the cross-section of the bottom similar to Sky Demon? And also, does it show terrain? It does, yes. Um, I'll try to go on the sim mode later on, um, and hopefully it will show, it will show the cross-section, but yes, it's similar to Sky Demon. And uh, Derek's pointed out, the more boxes equals more time You've got eyes in the cockpit. Exactly. So if I if I just take to so this is how I've configured mine. Now again, you can select it to go to switch between pages for cruise and climb. So you can have a page that has all the information you need in climb and one page. So things like average, um, average climb rates, instantaneous climb rates, where the thermal is, you can even install a thermal helper and all of that. What I found is that if you have a high workload and you and the pages keep switching, you very quickly become overwhelmed with with information. So the boxes that I've got configured there, it's the information that I know I'm going to need 90% of the flight. Now, if you've got someone like Graham or John McLaughlin, they might want a lot more information whilst they're uh, climbing um, than, than I need there. But for the level that I've got, this is a sort of compromise between information that I want to see and amount of space that I've got available to see that information. Um, once you've selected how, how many boxes you want and how you want, you can change these boxes uh, through the configuration menu. Something a lot easier to do is if you click on any of them um, and you sort of hold it for two or three seconds, it will come up with this menu and you can click on switch info box and you get taken to this menu that has essentially all of the information that you can have there. Quite usefully as well, once you click on one, it will tell you underneath the information that will it will provide you. I mean, sometimes it will provide the, the limitations as well. So you can uh, quite easily switch uh, between boxes or uh, change the boxes you want. When I've selected, um, when I've selected this particular configuration was to say, I've got essentially a, a cruise bar down here and a sort of more or less climb bar up there. So I know which side of the screen I, I want to look at. But again, all of this is completely changeable. You can you just click on a box and you can uh, switch in for box and you, you select whatever parameter you want to see. So let's suppose now that you want to create a task. Um, so uh, you go to menu, you go to navigation, and you'd be surprised to find that it is a task. Um, you can then um, click uh, to add a turn point. So let's say that 
you want to start from Cypher. And you can either use the name or the BGA turn point, um, so the, the trigraph uh, to select it. So you can then select that and it will say um, S, obviously for start, and it will tell you what type uh, it is. So in this case, it's a, a starting cylinder with a 0.3 kilometer radius. There was a lot of discussion on the group recently about start and finishing lines and so on. So if you click on edit point, you can then change what type that particular turn point is. So change, uh, change point and you can say, is it a start line? Um, is it a, a BGA start sector? Is it a, an FIA quadrant, uh, start quadrant, et cetera? In the configuration menu as well, you can change by default what those starts are. So you can say if it's a start line, uh, a cylinder, etc. So you can configure what those are as well. Uh, so let's say that you want a start line. You can then change the the width of that gate. So if you want a one kilometer gate, it will it will change that to a one kilometer gate. So when you click close, now you will see that it says line uh, and the gate width is one kilometer. Then you want to add the next turn point and to make this easy, we'll sort of go with stone. Um, so you've got a whole bunch of list um, uh, turn points that match that. So you can select stone and it will be your next turn point. And again, you can change that to a, a bisector um, if, if, you, if that's the kind of uh, turn points that you're using for the day. Um, you can then add a second turn point. Uh, go on. So let's say Litchfield Northeast. And then you want to come back to Seifert Um, so it doesn't necessarily revert to a finish line, but you can you can click where it says make finish. Uh, so all is done. So you've got your turn points, you've got your start and finish gates. When you click close, um, uh, click close again, and you can see the uh, the track line uh, there for your for your first turn point. And again, it will tell you what's your next turn point, how far you are, etc. That is really it. Uh, once you once you start flying, um, obviously your your glider will move, um, and you can you can zoom in if you want to be on a particular site. So if you use a start gate with particular rules, it kind of tells you which site um, you want you want to be on that sector to to start the uh, the flights. Um, another thing that you can do in terms of view, which is probably relevant now. It doesn't. The, the map doesn't really move. It's not like a, um, a phone screen where you press it and, and it moves. But you can uh, go to display and pan on, and you can move the map about just like that. And then you do pan off, and it will sort of stay in the area where you've panned the uh, the map into. Another thing you can do with with a display. Uh, sorry, with the pan option on. And you click what's there. It will sort of show you within that window that you've panned into what kind of features are there. And in, in this case, it's only the, the class A airspace that you need to worry about. A couple of questions, Thiago, from the, yep. from the guys. Chris Jones would like to know, can you save the task so that you could, you could select it? Yeah, I'm guessing you can save it and then choose the same task again in the future. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, I'll, I'll do that again. Sorry, some of these things I know how to do them. I just have, have to do them once to remind myself. So you've got your task loaded up. You go into menu, navigation and task. Um, and then you go to manage, you click save, you give it a name, so task. You click OK, um, and that's it really. If you want to load up a previous task, you go to exactly the same menu, but instead of clicking save, you go to browse, and you've got your, your task selected there. 
and then it will ask you if you want to select that task. And there you go. I'll load it up. Brilliant. And then we've got another question from Peter who'd like to know, can you use a Kindle? There's maybe a daft question, but is it possible? I don't think so. Um, in principle, as, as a bit of kit, yes, it would be exactly the same. I think the Kobo is designed a little bit better for you to access the files. I haven't seen people using Kindles, uh, which to me suggests that the way to access the essentially the memory of, of the Kindle is not as straightforward as it is with a Kobo. Okay, I just thought I'd ask because I, I physically have one and I wouldn't. Okay. Yeah, and I, 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 I tried the same. And the good thing about this is that this actually still works as a reader. Um, so I can switch between a Kobo um, and the XC source side of it. I think Amazon are a bit more fiddly and they don't necessarily want you to mess up with, with the software. I personally never seen anyone using a, a Kindle. Okay, thanks, Tago. Uh, so what I'll do, because Peter has asked for it, I'll see, I'll try to go on, on the SIM mode uh, so we can see the airspace cross section. So um, you can see there, we're still in ciphers. We've got the um, Daventry CTA above us. And obviously the terrain here is not, is not the best, but you, you can see there that you've got a bit of a, a, bit of a profile. Um, and if I make the, the glider go and try to zoom out, you will see that it will give you that distance. Um, and then as you, as you turn around, it will give you, so for example, if you're approaching, um, I'm trying to see if it changes. Yeah, so you can see there, you've got the different bits of airspace as you would with um, Sky Demon as well. Um, so in the sim mode there, you can kind of see the bit of information that I would have um, in flight. So it will, it will tell me the heading, um, to, um, to the next endpoint, the radio frequency, uh, the height that I'm above the ground, how far I am from my turn point, uh, the altitude that I need to get to that turn point, um, and then my, uh, my speed over the ground. With the ATC radial, um, I can then change uh, where I'm going to talk with. So let's suppose I want to talk with Tate Nil. Um, and close. So it will tell me uh, the, the radial from Tate Nil uh, to me and then the distance that I am. So the reason I've got that there, normally when you talk with air traffic control, you need to give a position and a distance. And I, I just find that having that information without me having to think about, oh, where exactly am I? It's just a lot, a lot easier. Does it give you the frequencies as well? Uh, it can do, uh, not necessarily there. Uh, not sure if you click on it actually. Uh, but one thing you can do is you can go to navigation and when you go to waypoint list, again, remember you're trying to do this um, in flight, um, is if you click Tate Nil, it will give you all the information about Tate Nil that you, that you need there. So including the, uh, the radio frequency. So it's, it's better to note it down before you fly. Yeah, I, I tend to find that that, so go on. If your next endpoint is state nil, you can see, um, so at the moment, my current, my next endpoint is ciphered and it's giving me the frequency for ciphered, but it depends on the input file. Uh, so if your airspace file and for that endpoint includes a frequency, it will show you the, the radio frequency. If not, it won't show, um, it won't show anything. So my advice would be yes, note it down uh, beforehand. Um, okay, so that's really all I had. I don't know if people have more pressing questions, things they want to see, um, things they want explained differently. Um, otherwise, I think we, we just go and enjoy our evening. Mm -hmm.